Now I want to take the center point. Center point is there, but it's not in the river. My example says it's in the river, so I want my point to be in the river. What do I do? I choose the point nearest to the center that is actually in the river. That happens to be right here. It doesn't necessarily have to be orthogonal. It could be over here or over there. Turns out for this example, the center is closest right there. That's where I'll put my point. And now, to get the final georeference, I need to go from that point and make a circle that includes this and includes that. How do I do that? I figure out which one's furthest from the center. Whichever one's furthest from the center, I draw the line there and my circle contains all of it. So that's the point radius representation of a segment of a river. The same thing would happen for a road. And I can see some thinking going on. Well, if this is such a poor representation of a river, why would you do it for a river? And I thought that for quite a long time. Until it dawned on me that if I have this circle, this georeference for the river, and I have GIS that has the river in it, then I can do an intersection of the river and my circle and come up with the actual shape of the river without having done any work. Well, without having done the kind of work I would otherwise need to do to create the polygon and store it in my, dis my database. Especially if my database is an Excel spreadsheet. Can you imagine storing shapes in Excel spreadsheets? Please don't. So, I can easily store a point radius in an Excel spreadsheet and only occupies four columns. Why four instead of three? Decimal latitude, decimal longitude, datum, and coordinate uncertainty in meters. That's sufficient to describe a circle and know exactly where it is on the Earth. Four columns. Now, I can combine that point radius with GIS and make a shape of the river and have a, a shape version of my locality. So all hope is not lost to do things with the point radius method. It's actually not a bad idea, it turns out. This is a case where if you look at the details, it's, I know it's hard to see details here, but if you look closely, the town Olancha is named right here, and there are some houses. And there are some houses here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. Houses go, they're everywhere. So it's a situation a little bit different from Jean, Nevada, where it seemed that you could say the town ends there because there are no more houses. Here we don't know where it ends, but what we do know is that there's another town here called Grant. So, what I would like to do to describe Olancha without knowing anything about its boundaries is to say, okay, it says Olancha, therefore it is not Grant. Use a little bit of logic on this georeference. It says Olancha, so it's not Grant. So, if I want to make a rule about that, I would say, if I go from Olancha in the direction of Grant, when I get halfway, I should be talking about Grant instead, because I'm nearer to Grant. Right? We're reserving this stuff on this side of the halfway point to be Grant, and the stuff on that side of the halfway point to be Olancha. In that case, what I can do is to create a georeference that starts at the center and goes halfway to the next nearest named place. Hope that makes sense. So, what I'm doing here is I'm giving you examples and I'm saying what the rules are. Now it might be when you decide to go georeferencing and you're an expert because you've taken a five-day course and you've looked at the details and you say, no, 
That's not right. We need to do it a different way. And you write your own rules. Then you would deviate from it. And you would document how you do things when you do your georeference. This we encountered, the problem of near. How do you georeference near? The idea is the same. The extent of the place depends on the center of the name place and whether we actually can see the boundaries of it. The other thing that happens is near could, there are a couple of ways to do it. One is to say, that near always means within a certain number of kilometers. Now, you kind of need to justify what that number of kilometers is. It's a little bit vague. But you could do so, and it would be a rule that everyone else could repeat. The alternative is this one, where near is much like a remote place. You say, it's near Fixburg if it's not near Klokolan. Right? Because if we were near Klokolan, we would say near Klokolan, and we'd be on that side of the halfway point. So it's similar to the remote case, and we georeference the same way. We take a point in the center of the named place, and we use a radius that goes halfway to the next nearest one. You can see we're repeating a pattern. We're trying to keep the number of rules to a minimum, so that you can remember them when you're doing it. Between two name places is a little easier to understand. We have two. It says between Springbok and I don't know how to say that, but I'll try. Kamiaskrun. Kamiaskrun. Between those two, there's Springbok and there's the other one. So what I want to do is I want to draw a line between the two. And between means somewhere basically in there. So I'll take as my point, the center point of the distance between the two, and I'll draw a circle that includes both of the others. So it's quite ample. It's everything that you might interpret as being between. That one seems fairly straightforward, at least in a simple case like that one. Then we get into the concept of offsets, which I described already in a talk. Simply speaking, they are the distance from a point of reference. And so we have examples of localities, locality types. Now we're into a different color in the quick reference guide where offsets appear, where we have some kind of a distance in the description. So this example is an example where there is a distance, but there's no direction given. It's just five kilometers from Bethlehem. Don't know which way. So what we do, is we calculate the extent of Bethlehem in the same old way, but in order to get the final result, we need to have a radius that adds five kilometers to that. So that's why here it's annotated to be 12.8 kilometers to this circle. Five kilometers of it comes from here. The other 7.8 kilometers comes from the size of Bethlehem because we may have started there or there or there. We don't know where in Bethlehem we started to go five kilometers. So that's that example. Another one is kind of the opposite, where we don't have a distance, but we do have a direction. So when you did your georeferencing exercise, you've seen some of this also. Some people wrote things like that. So this is an example where we go south from Springbok. The idea is the same as the remote place where you're going to go in that direction until you encounter a place where you would change how you described it. So in this example, I've got a named place down here called Gary's. If I was going this way, I would say I was going north of Gary's, at least until I got halfway. Then I'd probably say I'm south of Springbok. So you see the same sort of logic applying here as well. Then we finally get to one of the most common ways to describe a locality, and that is to use an offset at a heading 
from a named place. So it's got distance and direction. So in this case, Wartburg, no, sorry, Wartburg is the town. And this circle and this arrow describe just the town, as if I was georeferencing Wartburg alone. What that tells me is the extent of Wartburg. Just the extent. Now, I'm going to go 6.5 kilometers northeast from Wartburg, which means that I'm going to take my extent and I'm going to translate it in the northeast direction. When I do that, the end result is going to be another circle with another radius that's somewhere in that direction. The example that's on this slide is to go northeast by a road. That's what the, this signifies. Having gone northeast by the road, the northeast doesn't actually contribute any uncertainty. It's just telling me which road to take. But it is a little bit uncertain about how far I go. It's telling me to the nearest half kilometer. So my uncertainty over here should be as big as the extent of Wartburg plus at least half a kilometer to accommodate for that part of the uncertainty. There are many other examples in the quick reference guide for which no diagrams exist yet. And the best thing to do in those cases is to look at the examples and try to imagine them and try to find something similar to compare it against. And then, once you have a map or a diagram to look at, or wait for me to have free time to make more diagrams, or someone else because I didn't actually make any of those, and look at the descriptions and see if it makes sense how to draw the polygon and how to get the georeference and the extent and all of those things. The major message here is that this document, when you do georeferencing, is your friend. It's your Bible. It's how to do things in combination with other resources like maps or even things that like automatic georeferencing using a tool like Geolocate. So thank you for your attention and patience with me all day long. We will not do this to you again. <laughs> but later we meet. But not all day long. Thank you.